Hello and a wonderful afternoon or evening or good day to each and every one of you. My name is Thomas Maniago from Schwind iTech Solutions and I'm glad to welcome you to the Schwind webinar about customized treatments. Especially after the busy virtual ESCRS weekend, I'm happy that you are joining us. This is the second webinar with this topic and in case you have missed the first one with Dr. David Kang from Korea, you can check it out on the Schwind portal or in the internet or on our YouTube channel. But first of all, I would like to thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Samuel Abamasquera, as he is going to moderate the session, and Dr. Bruce Allen from, I, uh, from Morpheus Eye Hospital in London, who is with us today as a speaker. Thank you very much, both of you, for your participation. Further, my gratitude expands to my colleagues, Aliona Kessler, as her background work uh, made this webinar possible, and also the team of our application department, who are deeply involved in the workflow, which I'm going to present in a moment. I give now the word to Sam as the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so also welcome from my side uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, we have learned through the years uh, that the customized treatments are, uh, are really strongly discussed in the in the market in the refractive arena some people really advocate for that some people is a bit afraid of what may happen if i do it wrong and we encountered that uh, there are many questions that uh, are generally repeated over and over again about customized treatments and this was one of the reasons that we took this opportunity to make this webinar and to have also the input by thomas uh, or by Thomas to this side, uh, but also to share the experience of the clinical application in this case by uh, by Bruce Allen. Uh, I hope you will enjoy also this uh, this webinar. And Thomas will be starting with the workflow that the company through the years, Thomas and his team of about ten engineers and specialists in the application service uh, develop. Through, through the years with experience on customer students with the, with the Amaris on how to guide you in an easier and better way to get the maximum out of the, out of the treatment. So I'm very pleased to reintroduce Thomas back and give him the opportunity to, to present the, the standard operation that, that Schwind proposes. Thank you very much, Sam. I hope you all can see my screen with the presentation of the workflow of customized treatments. All right. So this is the workflow we typically use in our application department, and we thought it might be helpful and interesting for you so that you can participate and also make use of this workflow, because this workflow is also uh, in principle usable from each and every one. It contains, um, hold on a second, it contains nine steps which we use for um, for the analysis. It starts with anamnesis, then it continues with treatment preparation, decision tree, and reflective adjustment. And this is multiple checks, steps. And also the optimization of the ablation profile is also multiple steps. We will go through this till the end where the comparison of the treatment plan with the diagnostics is giving the okay or not okay how to continue. All right, step one of the nine steps is the availability of appropriate clinical data. And for us, the following information is mandatory for a treatment of a customized or a planning of a customized treatment. We need to have topographic Schwind uh, diagnostic information. We have to have a pachymetric information if the diagnostic file is not from Schwind Sirius. The Schwind Sirius is a Scheinflug system where we have all this pachymetric information available. Then we have it available. If not, ultrasound or any pathometry will be helpful. We also need the subjective manifest reflection, the uncorrected distance visual acuity, and the corrected distance visual acuity. And of course, the intended treatment mode. If we plan or if you plan a femtosecond laser, LASIK, a LASIK in general, PRK or LASIK, trans PRK, or if you plan a relief, maybe. And also very important for us is the general treatment target. In principle, we have two main targets. That is the reflective uh, target and the therapeutic target. If you go for the reflective uh, target, it means 
that you are pointing for an accurate reflection. So this is the goal of this treatment. Whereas in the therapeutic treatment, this is to minimize the tissue and uh, to get um, visual acuity, which is also improved or fine, but accepting that there might be some glasses left which are needed for the patient. And also we need to know specific patient's complaints, maybe night vision or maybe any complaints the patient has. So this is mandatory. If we go ahead with the following information, it's recommended. It's great to have the aberrometer refraction at four millimeter, or if you do not have this, at least the auto refraction values. It's good to have cycloplegic refraction, surely for hyperops and um, probably mist, mixed astigmatisms, but also for myopic patients, it can reveal, reveal sometimes surprises. So it's good to have this cycloplegic refraction it's good to have the Schwind diagnostic aberrometer file and the scotopic pupil size so that the planned optical zone is known and uh, which is going to be treated. And if no Schwind aberrometer is available, or if no aberrometer is available in general, a test with hard contact lens is useful to confirm that the customized treatment or, uh, improves, or a corneal wavefront treatment improves the uh, corrected distance visual acuity. Also check if a pinhole test improves the visual capacity, which helps to determine if the problem is related to the retina or the brain. So this is also useful and, and recommended information and we ask for this also. We don't get it always, but this is helpful. Now we are in step two of the nine steps. And this should uh, consider the following activities, which are typically here in our uh, company it means we have to anonymize clinical data or hope that it already received anonymized. anonymized. We have a transaction key, a patient ID and the patient initials. So we don't need the patient name itself or the details from that. Yeah. We, in our situation, when you send some files into our company, we reprocess the files. This is something you don't have to do if it is here in your practice. You have measured it, you don't need to reprocess this but you should also select your best measurement and set this as a favorite. Because we have seen it might happen, you make multiple measurements, maybe you have three measurements, and then you look in the first glance, you look on the first measurement and say, this is my favorite. Then on a second look in the treatment planning, you say, oh, number two looks slightly better, I choose this, but you don't set it as a favorite, so it's still not marked as a favorite. And then finally, you plan your treatment with number three, so for us, it's also important to say which reference point, reference measurement was taken into account for the planning. And then we export the best diagnostic file. So to say our favorite. Now we are in a very crucial step also, which is the selection of the treatment type with help of the decision tree. So if you are a user with our device, you can load the imported diagnostic data in the comparison module with the Schwindcam, and you can consider the following. You can select the six millimeter zone and press apply to get all the values. And in principle, you check for the corrected distance visual acuity, the root mean square of the higher order, and if the patient suffers from visual differences. I zoom in with the workflow, with the decision tree. And as you can see my mouse, the first step is, Ideally, you have the ocular wavefront and the corneal wavefront. And you check if your higher order, your root mean square of the higher orders in any of these both devices is always less than a 0.25 diopters. Anyway, if it is, uh, so this is a root mean square for six millimeter optical zone. If they are not significant, if they are low, they will be labeled as green, as green with the green color. And then there's nothing is significant and you go ahead with a non-customized pure aberration free treatment. In case you are uh, with the root mean square of the higher order between the 0.25 and the 0.5 you're running here in the ocular wavefront or corneal wavefront. The next question will be how about is your uh, corrected distance visual acuity? Because if you are between 0.25 and 0.5 root mean square higher orders you probably have some yellow um, aberrations, which means take care. These are maybe critical, maybe maybe are going to be critical later on. So then you also check 
for the visual acuity. If your visual acuity is 2020 or better, then we go here to the left and you check about visual complaints, your quality of night vision. If there are no complaints, if everything is fine, again, it votes for an aberration free treatment. If there is any complaint or if the visual acuity is less than 2020, or if your root mean square of the ocular or corneal wavefront is more than or equal to 0.5, then it goes with yes to that area here, where you check out for the difference of the ocular and corneal wavefront. In the most cases, the ocular wavefront and the corneal wavefront will provide very similar information, but not necessarily. So if the difference of two devices is less than 0.375 diopters, then um, you go out here and you check which diagnostic information provides a larger diameter of information. In case it is a corneal wavefront, you go with corneal wavefront. In case your diameter is larger with ocular wavefront, you go for ocular wavefront. In most situations, the ocular wavefront, as we typically not dilating, your ocular wavefront is limited by the pupil size, by the pupillar opening. Therefore, in the most cases, if your difference is less or, or minor, so to say, then it votes for a corneal wavefront. However, if the difference is significant between the ocular and the corneal wavefront, it means that there are some internal aberrations, something is going on, and this is an indication which votes for the ocular wavefront. However, if there are some indication about age for, for intraocular exchange, then it's said, okay, better not to do a treatment first, change the intraocular lens. Otherwise, no, if there is no indication, you go for the ocular wavefront. This is a decision tree which we typically use and which you also find also as a Schwind user on the, on the background of your panel PC as an information. So the next step is something which we call evaluation of the higher order the reflection. The higher order aberrations have an influence on the subjective reflection. And with this OLKCAM software, you can calculate or the software calculates a higher order reflection. And so take note of that higher order reflection, note this down, and, uh, and you choose this to do with the relevant ocular or corneal wavefront. So in case you got with the decision tree ocular wavefront, you note down the higher order reflection coming from the ocular. If it comes from the cornea, from the decision tree, you note down your higher orders reflection value from the cornea. And make sure that you change analysis diameter to the planned optical zone, and then you press apply, and you note down the higher order reflection. If you don't have this software, it's uh, a little bit challenging. Yeah. However, we have some more values which we should consider. We also always do a vectorial mean calculation of the reflection. Um, when a customized treatment is recommended according to the decision tree, we perform the first reflection adjustment based on the summary of the manifest reflection, the aperometer reflection at four millimeter, the topographic astigmatism, and the wavefront astigmatism at four and at six millimeter. So as you see in my small sample here with the table, you see these five values for sphere cylinder and axis and the vertex distance, and of course, the sphere is only available in the manifest and aberrometer reflection. And then we have the cylindrical values. And uh, it calculates the vectorial mean of the software. And uh, you see, even if we only have two sphere values and uh, five cylinder values, the sphere might be a little bit different to what we have seen in the manifest or in the aberrometer reflection. And now, if you don't have an aberrometer available, Alternatively, we ask, or you can ask and check for the auto reflection from the auto refractometer. And based on this SAQ of the manifest reflection and the mean value of the five astigmatism values, the adjusted vectorial mean can be calculated. So this is a calculation we have here. So this is a reflection calculation. And then we continue with a comparison of ablation profiles. We evaluate the ablation profile in aberration-free mode, so to say in a non-customized mode with the manifest reflection. Imagine you, um, you go in your software, load, uh, start with an aberration-free using the manifest reflection which you have measured before. 
You can easily do this with the OK Cam. You load in the diagnostic file, either from corneal or ocular wavefront. You use your subjective reflection and use your and select your planned treatment method. You are selected octave zone for the treatment and you press apply. And then you go in the manager and deactivate all higher orders in the pyramid function and you press OK. And then you note down when you are back in the main menu the maximum ablation depth. So this will be the the needed tissue for this ablation using an aberration free mode with the manifest reflection. And we also further look and note down the difference in ablation between the center and the periphery. So these are two values which we note down in that moment in time. And then we switch from the aberration free mode to the corneal wavefront mode or ocular wavefront mode. And we evaluate this ablation profile in this customized mode with the formally adjusted refraction. So this adjusted refraction comes from the vectorial mean calculation. If you are a user from the ORK CAM software, you can continue using the previous settings and you exchange the subjective manifest reflection by the adjusted refraction with the vectorial mean. You go into manager and you activate all higher orders with pyramid function and press OK. And you go back in the main menu and you note the maximum ablation depth. So in principle, there are two values which are interesting. Aberration free with the manifest reflection, corneal so or customized treatment with the vectorial adjusted reflection. And both values will be then subtracted from each other to get the delta, the difference. In example, in customized treatment, maybe you have 50 microns of ablation depth, whereas in an aberration free treatment, non-customized, you get uh, 35 microns. So the delta will be 50 microns, very easy, one five. And then the next step is step seven, calculation of the tolerance factor. And this tolerance factor is depending on the difference in this ablation profile, aberration free versus customized with a level of tolerance uh, in depth. And this depth tolerance is 10 microns because this represents about um, three quarters of a diopter in an aberration free treatment uh, six millimeter zone. So in principle, you write down this um, delta, which means the delta in ablation depth in customized treatment using this vectorial mean adjusted refraction and the ablation depth in a pure aberration free non-customized treatment with the manifest reflection. So in our case, it was 15 microns. So 15 microns was the delta in my example. So 15 divided by 10 microns will give the tolerance factor, which is 1.5. And this 1.5 tolerance factor is then our guiding us for the next step, for the optimization of the ablation profile. And we have a table as you see here. And this TF is a tolerance factor. If this tolerance factor is less than one or equals to one, there's no change. So that means that the customized and the treatment uh, you have decided or the non-customized treatment you have decided for, both are fine and you can proceed. Uh, we expect no criticality out of that. If your tolerance factor is less than two, so in like in our example with, uh, uh, 1.5, then you should go to the pyramid function of the ORK cam and minimize there. So what ha what's happening in minimize? In minimize, the software selects these higher orders, which are indicated to be significant, so severe, and it selects also the one which are contributing to safe tissue. So in that moment, if you go to this pyramid minimize, it will save some tissue and uh, and you can proceed. If your tolerance factor due to a larger delta between the customized and the non-customized treatment is somewhere between two and three, so less than or equal to three, then first go to the reflection manager with the default constraints. And this reflection manager with the default constraints makes the following. The default constraints representing about 1.25 diopters in a spherical equivalent. And now the software looks automatically for the refraction, which either 
sphere, cylinder, or even axis. So it looks for the refraction, which is within this SEQ of 1.25 uh, dioptes, so within these constraints, which is saving tissue. So it makes a trial and error, next trial and saving tissue, yes or no. So it, it makes this automatically till it finds out the best refraction within these constraints. And then um, you further go on with the pyramid where the minimized functionality is given. Again, for the higher order, you can select the significant or the potentially significant aberrations, higher order aberrations, and it selects also the ones which are contributing to safe tissue. So this is for a tolerance factor uh, between two and three. If your tolerance factor is more than three, you go with the, or we go, however, we go with the refraction uh, functionality of the software with extended constraints. And remember these extended constraints come also from the um, vector, vectorial mean value. So it allows a larger range for the software to search for a refraction, which is optimized to save tissue. If you don't have this software available, you can do it yourself. In, in, you can play a little bit around with your sphere. In principle, you can play a little bit around with your astigmatism and your axis. But if you play a little bit around with your sphere, making it a quarter higher or a quarter lower or half a diopter more or half a diopter less, in some moment, you maybe find a refraction which is more beneficial to save tissue. This is what's, hap what's happening in the refraction mode automatically with the Schwind over KKM software. If you are going with the tolerance factor to a maximum for therapeutic treatments, so then you disable the constraints. So it's looking for a refraction from minus 15 to plus 15, so to say, which is optimizing for saving tissue. So in that moment of, of the procedure, we don't take care if postoperatively the patient will be plus five or minus seven. The matter is to save tissue, to make the depth of ablation minimum in order to have an ablation profile, which is going to increase the visual acuity. And in addition, of course, we also use the pyramid function for the higher order aberrations. So consider the following hints. Use this minimize depth and minimize volume function and decide for the most conservative profile. So check minimize depth, minimize volume, and the most conservative is a good choice. If optimized ablation is outside the tolerance, start from the beginning with the next tolerance factor. So if you uh, see that after optimizing the pyramid, you are still out of the range with this um, 1.5, you go and uh, repeat this with the next higher tolerance factor. Or if the optimized ablation is less than aberration free, you start with the next lower tolerance factor. So it means we are running maybe through this uh, procedure, the first seven, eight steps multiple times. Yeah, Normally it's only one time, but it might happen that we have to run through another time. Yeah. So this is what we always check for. And after this, step eight still, in case of mixed astigmatism or in case of hyperopia, further optimization might be necessary. So we evaluate the difference in the profile we have decided for between the central and peripheral ablation depth. And we'll compare this value with the original aberration free and the manifest reflection. Maybe you remember some slides ago, some steps ago, we note down in the aberration free mode using the manifest reflection, we note down the difference between central and periphery. And now we compare it with the ablation profile we are going to apply for the patient. If the difference is within 10 microns, it's acceptable. But when the difference is more than the above mentioned value, we change or then change the sphere until the difference is within this limit. This avoids also unexpected surprises. And then step nine as a last step, compare the treatment plan with the diagnostics and check if there's a correlation in the shape or in the depth or volume of the stromal ablation profile with, with the corner topography, check it with the corneal wavefront map, check it with the elevation map, and also compare the pre-op K reading stigmatism value 
with the estimated and calculated cost of care reading astigmatism. For example, if the axis turns between the pre-op and the, the post-op K reading astigmatism, then it's very suspicious. If it's before with the rule and post-operative against the rule, then it's strange. Then you maybe have to rethink twice and see if another method would be better. Also, if the post-op difference in the K reading, so the post-op astigmatism is higher than the pre-op astigmatism, then it's suspicious. Example. The pre op K reading was in one axis 38, the other axis 36, so two diopters easily to understand. And post op expected K reading is 44 and K2 41, so three diopter for astigmatism. So the software already indicates and tells you mm, post operatively it is more than pre operatively. Then in readjusting, refraction might be advisable. And you see this workflow you have seen in the first steps is something which works quite well, but not in all circumstances, not for all patients. We are happy if it works for 70, 80 percent. That, that's clear, that's great. Yeah, and it, it offers you a guideline, a workflow to start with. And if you see, or if our team sees, this is not what we expect, this is not what is beneficial for the patient. We feel free to bring in our experience and, and modify this. We always bring, and you also always bring in your experience. But then it is more, more critical um, and we have to look what is maybe adjustable to optimize that. As a summary, you see the nine steps, one in a row. Um, available or availability of appropriate clinical data is the first step. And then preparation of the diagnostic data, select which measurement and so on. And select the treatment type by following the decision tree. Evaluate the higher order refraction to see how much impact from the higher order comes. Calculate the adjusted refraction by the calculation of the vectorial mean. And then compare the ablation profile. Remember, non-customized, aberration-free with the manifest refraction versus customized using the modified vector analyst uh, refraction. And then calculate your delta. Check for the calculation with the tolerance factor and see what is your recommendation to continue. Optimized reflection, optimized pyramid, what's going on? This is in the optimization of the ablation profile. And then compare your treatment plan with the diagnostics. Check your wavefront maps, check your maps, and see if this really makes sense to you, if this is logical, if it is following that. At the end, we have here a printout, a workflow, a data summary, so to say, which you can use or which can be used for fill out the patient data, number of the best examination from the shine fluke, topography, abrometer, keratoscopy or topo abrometer measurement, further data you have available, your treatment parameters like the method, your target, you are going for tissue saving or you prefer accurate refraction, um, ocular or corner wavefront, your optical zone and your Sphere cylinder axis values for the manifest refraction, auto refraction or abrometer, cycloplegic, topographic astigmatism, wavefront astigmatism, adjusted higher order refraction, and uh, no, adjusted refraction from the vectorial mean and the higher order refraction. So, this is uh, and helpful to have this all at one glance, as we see here also visual acuity. And here in the lower area, you fill in the values from the depth of ablation, the delta between center and periphery, your customized uh, ablation depth, and your delta from ablation depth customized versus aberration free non customized. So, this is something which gives you an overview um, and guides you what is needed and helpful for this. So, this is how we proceed, how we do it in the ablation, uh, in the application department. And um, this is the workflow we follow. And I think you as a shrimp user, you can follow this workflow very easily. And even if you are non, even if you are a non shrimp user, you can follow these ideas and you can guide yourself. Uh, maybe it will be a little bit more rough and complicated, but in principle, these steps are universal. So thank you for watching me and uh, I give my word back to the moderator. Thank you all of you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh...
I was involved directly or indirectly in some of these uh, preparations and and I really know what a deal of effort uh, you and your team have put into into that uh, those concepts and and this uh, presentation and uh, so yeah thank you very much I really much uh, believe and uh, that your last comment that this kind of idea not only viable for the Schwind users but with some tweaks maybe extended to to a more general application for any platform uh, I think is is really really important uh, and we mentioned we will let the questions for for the end uh, but to give you a motivational uh, impact uh, someone already contact in the question and answers and mentioned that after a little time he fully understands now how the refraction adjustment works. So it's already a positive message that that, that you're you're conveying the message was was the right uh, approach. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you so, and thank you also for your contribution to that workflow. Yeah. Uh, now uh, we move from the very important workflow to the clinical use of this or a similar workflow. And it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Bruce Allen. I think I have nothing to say uh, about him. Everyone uh, knows him. I have been following him uh, for very many years. Uh, uh, of course, uh, he is the perfect Englishman. Uh, and I like him very much, not only because of his knowledge, but also because we share the same name. So, uh, yeah, you told me once, uh, Bruce, at least there were a couple of beers or wines behind us. Uh, and so I let you the podium for you. Please show us how you can do the best out of this workflow for your patients. Great. Well, thanks very much indeed, Sam. Let's just see my screen there. And uh, you're all seeing what I'm seeing there. You can perhaps give me a sign if you can. Can you still hear me there, Sam? All right. Everything's fine. You're seeing oh, everything. That's great. Okay. Well, look, good morning, good evening, whatever time it is. Uh, following Thomas is never easy. He is such a professional and he has an uncanny ability to stay on time as well. I noticed his, his presentation was exactly half an hour. So, um, whereas <laughs> I have no sense of time at all. And so you may have to, uh, the great thing about a webinar is I can be cut off automatically if I'm going on too long. But one thing I would like to say there is that, uh, is in by way of a financial declaration is is that uh schwind is certainly not paying me to do this i'm here because i am a schwind super fan and uh and they're the only excima company that i've worked with that are truly interested in pushing the boundaries and extending what they do to the difficult therapeutic cases as well and i think that's you know what we're also interested in as clinicians it's really great to work with people like sam and thomas and the team and to, to feel as if they're listening to you and really wanting to push the technology further. So last uh, time the webinar went out, I think you heard from uh, from David uh, Kang about, about the corneal wavefront treatments primarily, and he did a great job on that. So I'd really encourage you to tune into the portal if you didn't see that and, and give that a review. And today we're gonna focus a little bit more on ocular wavefront treatments and the pyramidal wavefront sensor, the Paramis, that is the partner sensor for the Amaris platform, and uh, some of the ways you can use that and integrate it into your practice. So it's uh, a little step forward from the Hartman Shack aberometers that are used with the other platforms, and the key difference is in avoiding problems with spot crossover. So we were all with Hartman Shack before, including Schwind with the IRX, and we've moved over to the Paramis most recently. And whereas Hartman Shack aberometry works by sampling emergent light over the pupil, seeing how far away it is from the expected locus and using that information to calculate wavefront uh, information. Here with pyramidal aberometry, you've got a pyramidal element that splits the emergent light into four images of the pupil and differences between these four images can be used to derive wavefront information. And this is important in therapeutic treatments because with the uh, Hartman-Shack systems, if you have a very irregular cornea, 
it, uh, you get what's called spot crossover. The neighboring sensor picks up light addressed to its neighbor's locus. And so once the cornea gets beyond a certain state of irregularity, in other words, the corneas you really like to treat, uh, then often you can't do it with a hartman shack system. Uh, whereas we're hoping you can do more with pyramidal aber aberometry, and we're learning a lot about that now. So David, uh, in his webinar, said a really important thing, I think, and that's to make the, uh, the, the customized treatments your friend by using them in your routine practice. And there are real advantages to doing that above and beyond just gaining familiarity. In routine wavefront treatment, I think the key advantages for your straightforward myopic LASIK, really number one is measurement precision. If you compare manifest refraction to auto refraction using a wavefront sensor, most modern wavefront sensors are considerably more accurate, about twice as accurate, in fact, in terms of measurement repeatability, and they're particularly strong on cylinder. The other thing I like about wavefront guided treatment is that the refraction numbers are ported straight from the machine to the laser. There's no possibility of you typing in the wrong number. And if you do enough laser treatment, sooner or later, you will make a human error. It doesn't matter how good you are. And the third, and in fact, I think the least important advantage for routine treatments is tailored treatment for aberrations. If you add up all the higher order aberrations, the the spherical equivalent effect of them in a normal eye, it's around about quarter of a diopter or less. So not a huge deal. So that's a more of a marginal advantage. So the real advantages are these first two, that's protection from human error and measurement precision. So we've recently published on routine wavefront LASIK using the Paramis and uh, parabolal, a pyramidal Aberometry, and I hope that this publication will give you all confidence to start using the Paramus in your routine wavefront treatments. Look over to the results panel here. I'm not sure if you're seeing the arrow that I'm projecting here, but first of all, in round numbers, uh, repeatability limits. That's the um, that's the range within which 19 times out of 22 consecutive measurements will lie. It's 0.3 diopters for the sphere. It's 0.2 diopters for the cylinder, and it's about 0.1 diopters for the third and third, fourth orders. That's comatrefoil and spherical aberration. So to give you an idea, that's at least twice as good as manifest refraction there. And so that's a satisfying finding. And that's in line with the best hartman shack aberometers too. So the Paramus is performing well in terms of taking accurate measurements. And in terms of our results, about 95% of our eyes were in half a diopter of the target spherical equivalent, which is right on the theoretical limit, really, for, for routine LASIK. And we were getting 95% approximately, again, right on the theoretical limit of patients' 2020 unaided first shot. And what was really impressive were the results, were the results for cylinder. And we were getting 97% of eyes within half a diopter or less post-optively. And so you're know, all very encouraging. I hope that if you look through this paper, it will give you the confidence to go ahead and start using the Paramis system to program routine wavefront treatments. I'm gonna walk you through how to do that here, but if you don't get this, I'm gonna do this at breakneck speed, just tune into my YouTube channel. There are videos there that walk you through it that you can see at your leisure. And uh, so it's not necessarily something you'll get the first time you run through it, a bit like Thomas's talk, really. The content is great. You need to hear it two, three, four times to really get into it. But it's all there on the YouTube channel if you want it, easy to find. So first of all, taking accurate scans, whatever measurement technique you're using in ophthalmology, it's good to do it in a protocol-driven way. And what I would say about wavefront scanning is make it the first examination you do before the patient has got fatigued by other examinations before the tear film has been altered by photopic stimuluses and squeezing. And so make it the first thing you do. Try and take three scans quickly so you get a really good impression of the patient's wavefront and a nice set of readings. Uh, don't combine your measurements with topography for the same reason. You want your pyramidal aberrometry scan to be done quickly. Uh, with the least amount of fatigue to the patient, the least amount of asking them to hold their eyes open wide so they're in as natural condition 
as possible and standardize your patient instructions as well. These are all tips that will help you. So you've got your scans up on the Phoenix software here. And the first thing to do is to right click on one of these scans and look at the quality indicators. It drops out this dialog box here and you get stats and acquisition. And it brings up this very useful summary information here for the eye you're looking at. And you've got your three scans here. And we usually choose the largest pupil size, all other things being equal. You've got your spherical equivalent measures here. You can just go for the medium. That's another strategy. And you've got your astigmatism display here. And you're looking for a reasonably narrow range of measurements here within half a diopter here if you're going to proceed with a wavefront guided treatment. And so we picked our scanner to say we use the largest pupil. There are other strategies and the median of three in terms of the spherical equivalent is not a bad one either. And then we're sending that through and looking at that scan in detail. And here a little tip is to uh, set the, um, the display here up to the dioptric spherical equivalent value for each of your indices here, sphere, cylinder, and the second orders here, coma, trefoil, and spherical aberration. Those are the main ones that you're really interested in, plus the summary figure over here. And that uh, quickly gives you an idea of, in really an, an intuitive way, of how important your aberrations are. We've got the full pupil here, but you can play with the pupil size here if you want to, to see what these aberrations read at a photopic pupil size as well. But that's useful summary information there. And so we're going to send that to our SchwindCam software. And we're going to do the same with the topography. We're going to right click, look at the quality values, pick out a scan that we like. It's far less important the topography measurement if you're doing an ocular wavefront guided treatment. You're really only using it to modulate the cosine adjustment to energy in the periphery of the ablation. And we're going to choose a scan we like here. It's obvious here the quality indicates are better on this scan than the others. And we're going to go with that and export it. And so we're now through to our treatment planning screen and we are selecting an ocular wavefront guided treatment. We've imported our wavefront scan, we've imported our topography scan, we've got all our indices here. And the little thing I always do here after we've checked the back vertex distance here, this case was in fact on the default setting which was 12 millimeters, is I go over to the radius here, you don't need the offsets if you're doing an ocular wavefront guided treatment. And, and uh, Sam can explain uh, a little more about that later, but I've talked about this with him at some length. If you're sampling over the pupil, it makes sense to center on the pupil. I believe it's actually only the higher, the, the lower orders that are shifted to the corneal vertex in this scheme. But I always set this to zero. Perhaps we can debate that later. And uh, then you're ready to send this through in the usual way, having set that to zero and made your nomogram adjustments. Now, this will comment out on in the end. And again, we've described in the literature how we make the nomogram adjustments here. It's easy to do. And that uh, deals with the dilemma you always have in customized treatment. And Thomas um, alluded to this in his vectorial mean uh, method of calculations. What do you do when the, ab the abrometric refraction and your manifest refraction differ as they always do? How do you, how do you via between these differences? And you can use a simple nomogram as we published, or indeed you can use uh, a more structured approach that Thomas showed you just now. But this works well for us. So sending that through, and you always get these uh, quality warnings here relating to expansion of the optical zone. You can go up to a millimeter over the wavefront acquisition diameter. So if you've got an acquisition over 5.5 millimeters, you're not going to compromise your optical zone in treatment. And you've got your summary panel there and you're ready to go. So which patients do we treat uh, with a, in other words, what's our decision tree with our routine wavefront treatments? Well, we're looking for three scans within half a spectacle unit of each other ideally within half a spectacle unit of the spherical equivalent of the manifest refraction too. If it's not, we go back and look at a cycloplegic refraction. And we're also looking at a good 
wavefront diameter. And this tends to select out the older patients in whom you might be worried about the lens. And a point that David made last time out is that you don't want to treat aberrations in the lens on the cornea, and I accept that. But in younger patients, uh, the, le the lens is normal, normally uh, fairly normal, and so there's quite a strong argument, I think, for wavefront guided treatment, uh, particularly if there's any astigmatism in the lens. You don't want to live with that for 20 years before you're ready for your lens exchange surgery. And also in the ectasis, there's a strong argument for it as well. I'd like you to do a little something here. That's if you've got a Mac, you can hit Control, Shift, and uh, three and screenshot this because it's a really important link here. Here's our paper to describe how, how we do how we do our, our nomogram adjustments. But this is something that Sam shared with me from Larry Thibos, who is uh, a really uh, useful source reference in terms of his thinking on wavefront decomposition. And this little link here is one of the clearest things I've read in terms of expressing the, uh, your wavefront uh, indices in either micron terms or equivalent dioptric terms, which I find a lot more intuitive and easier to understand, and how these two things link together. And that's a really good piece of homework. So just screenshot that and follow that link up. So we're going to come through to the therapeutic treatments now, and uh, we're going to start off with uh, the kind of things we typically see in routine practice. And, you know, the reason that I'm so glad that Schwimmed are, are so keen on extending the, their capabilities to the therapeutic area is that many of us are corneal surgeons as well, and we have these difficult patients we'd like to be able to help. And so, again, there's stuff on YouTube about my approach here, and so if you miss any of this, please check it out there in a bit more detail. And these are the kind of cases we typically see, the old RK cases, for example, the small zone 1990s PRK cases. Um, the post keratoplasty cases in corneal praxis, we see them all the time. The ectasias, post-infection, again, we see it all the time. And then there's uh, some very common things that we run into, like epithelial basement membrane dystrophies that we can easily uh, improve, and the Saltzman's dystrophies as well that we can improve as well. So these are the typical cases with irregular astigmatism we see all the time. How do we investigate them? Well, uh, the difference between a trial contact lens and a spectral corrected acuity will give you a sense of how much irregular astigmatism you're dealing with. If you haven't got contact lens over refraction, then, uh, then, then a trial contact lens fitting rather, then a pinhole acuity is the next best thing. You need your aberrometry, your topography, and your segmental tomography too, OCT tomography. All these investigations are very helpful. But basically, to quantify irregular astigmatism, it's the difference between uh, your vision in a rigid contact lens and your vision in spectacles. So something that's very useful in terms of your thinking, I think, is to start out by uh, deciding whether you've got to do a gross shape correction. The laser is for fine tuning, and so you might want to do something like a superficial keratectomy first, or even a corneal, new corneal transplant if you're completely out of range. Or you might want to do a scrape if it's a, um, a Saltzman's nodule. It's a, something, if, you know, as I say, don't try and do gross corrections with the laser. And then once you're into the fine tuning territory, that's, you know, corrected vision at the driving standard or better as a general rule of thumb then you can start to work with the laser to improve it. And then the last step is to iron out the lower orders. And people need to know when you're doing a correction for irregular astigmatism, your priority is to regularize the corneal shape. And again, David made that point really nicely on the last twin webinar. And then once you've done that, you can go on to correct the lower orders, either with a retreat or like a trans PRK here. Very safe to do, very safe to repeat or you can use a lens-based technique to iron out the lower orders when you finish. So the patients need to know that it's quite a trip and they've got to stay with you through that. So in terms of gross correction, you've got your superficial keratectomy, wound revision, we've got astigmatic keratotomies, uh, ring segments, we've got keratoplasty if all else fails. So all these are all the tricks we've got in our armamentarium to get the cornea grossly back in shape. 
and then you're ready for doing your laser treatments. But two particular examples I look out for here, don't go straight to the laser with these. If you've got epithelial basement membrane dystrophy and it's affecting vision, this is more common than people realize. People talk a lot about recurrent erosions, not nearly enough about irregular astigmatism, then an alcohol debridement is very good for this. And if you've got this situation here where you've got uh, peripheral solenoid change, not uncommon again, these lesions just peel off. And a nice investigation to do is the OCT. If Bowman's looks intact, then you're looking at doing a peel or a scrape rather than sharp dissection. With sharp dissection, you're just going to be making astigmatism worse. Anyone who's done a lot of pterygium surgery will tell you that. You want to peel before you do sharp dissection. So having grossly regularized the corneal shape, it's transepithelial PRK. And one thing I would say, unless you're dealing with an abnormal epithelial phenotype or a recurrent erosion syndrome, then you always want to make your treatments transepithelial. And this, this picture tells the story here. It's an OCT. And you can see how the epithelium is the best masking agent we have. Right? It's thickening over the troughs of this uh, dystrophy here and thinning over the peaks. And the ablation rate for the epithelium is very similar to the stroma. And so a transepithelial treatment gives you be the best chance of reproducing the surface shape in the stroma beneath. So always transepithelial if the epithelial phenotype is normal. And if you get a good wavefront sequence, then we're going to be doing a, an ocular wavefront guided treatment. David will argue that it should be corneal wavefront guided. You can make your mind up when you've heard the arguments. But certainly, I think that the one of the key advantages of ocular wavefront treatment is that it's relatively easy to plan. If you don't get a good wavefront scan sequence, though, you're looking at your topography scanning. And if you get a good scan sequence there, then you do a topography guided treatment. And if you don't get a good scan sequence with either, if your cornea is too irregular, then have a look at the work of Paolo Vinciguerra and his, his sequential liquid masking technique, which I really like for uh, doing a, a PTK and again, getting the cornea into a more regular state, such that you can get better information from your scanners. So it's an iterative approach and patients need to know that between each repeated laser treatment, at least there's six months for the corneal shape to regularize and to get the final score on that or you go to a new stage. So patients need to know that uh, it's a long trip and a journey that they have to embark on you with right from the beginning and to be patient with you throughout. So parabital aver averometry, as I said, the key advantage here in these irregular corneas is, is avoiding spot crossover. And that's one of the things I really like about this as a way of doing ocular wavefront guided treatments in these difficult cases. Here's an example. Uh, it's a post-RK case, and I've got this up on YouTube again, so you can go back to it if you want to see it again. But have a look at these two placebo images, which really tell you the story. You can actually see an impression of the, of the uh, quatrefoil uh, pattern you've got here on this side. Visual acuity about the driving stand, so within range for a uh, therapeutic laser treatment. On the other side, you've got this gross abnormality down there. This is a large epithelial plug. And so here you need to go do your stage one of your one, two, three approach in a regular sequence. And you need to do a surgical regularization that's to remove this epithelial plug, put in sutures, wait six months, take the suture out, and then redo the scans. So Turning to the right eye first, did we get a good scan sequence? We pulled up our quality indicators here by right-clicking one of the images, and yes, we did. We've got three fairly closely aligned scans here, and so we're ready to go with a therapeutic trans-PRK. And this is what we did here on this right-hand side. Here are the preoperative indices, and you can see you've got a lot of aberration here, quite a lot of quatrefoil here, about three quarters of the diopter, and so that's quite a typical um, post-RK situation. And on the other side, this is after the treatment here and a very pleasing result. You can see that we've got down to a little bit of myopia. Okay, not a bad thing in, in radial keratotomy because you know they're going to drift, and, uh, but a very nice uh, corrected acuity here. So not a bad result in the right eye. In the left eye, we've done our plug removal. That's before and that's after, but have a look at the acuities here. 
we're back in the land of the living and we really don't need to do any more after that. This is uh, all we need to do at this stage. And so a nice little example of this one, two, three approach here, start with gross regularization if you're, if you're acuity is, is really worse than the driving stand and you've got a very irregular cornea. The laser, remember, there for fine tuning. And then really, I think your decision tree should depend on your scan sequence. If you're getting good scanning information, the manifest refraction is very variable in irregular astigmatism and often inaccurate. So for me, the scan sequence and how repeatable your scans are gives you a clue as to how safe you are to use them as a base for your treatment. And if you get a good wavefront scan sequence, it's wavefront guided treatment. If you get a good topography scan sequence, your wavefront scan sequence is poor, then it's topography guided treatment. And if not, you're looking at a, a PTK. And as I say, I really like Paolo's, uh, Paolo Vinci Guerra's liquid masking for that. And then you do the lower orders with either a lens-based technique or repeat trans-PRK later down the track. I'm going to race through the ectasias now because I imagine the time is getting long. I'm just going to look at my phone, and it is. Gosh, my goodness, we need to leave time for discussion. So I'm going to truncate this and say to you, you can look it up. Again, it's on YouTube, and just walk you through this very quickly. And the aim here is to minimize uh, the amount of tissue you're removing. That's the most important thing by far. And so here we're really looking at the manager function and making that your friend. And I'm just going to quickly go through make the point here that the optical zone, it's not like a myopic ablation where if you increase the optical zone, you increase, increase your ablation depth in an irregular cornea like one of the ectasias and a more peripheral ablation pattern. This doesn't hold true. You can expand the optical zone without, uh, without getting a deeper ablation if you're using the manager function. Don't be afraid to do that. Wavefront guided treatments give you uh, reduced tissue removal, primarily because you're taking into account the posterior cornea here and the partial compensation you get from that. So the programming, again, is on YouTube. I won't go through that in too much detail here, but just to say what's happening really when you're using the manager function, using this graphic here. If you're using the manager function and you untick the constraints, then what you're really telling the laser to do in the refractive panel is you're telling the laser just correct the irregular astigmatism. Don't make any adjustment for the spherical equivalent effect of doing that. What we used to do is we used to type in naught and naught in the sphere and the sill of our wavefront guided treatments, thinking that we were not going to make any change to the sphere and the cylinder. That was our goal. We just wanted to improve uh, the corrective visual acuity, say if we're doing an optical zone expansion. Now, if you do that, the laser understands that instruction as, yeah, correct the irregular astigmatism, but also then do a second phase of ablation to compensate for the change you made to the cylinder and the sphere by correcting the irregular astigmatism. It turns out the amount of tissue you're removing is actually deeper in this phase than just in the correction of the irregular sequence. So if you tell the laser, we don't care how much spherical equivalent and cylinder change you make, we can correct that with a lens and ICL later. What we do care about is getting the spectacle or a corrected acuity better so that when we've locked in this change with cross-linking, we can use an ICL to correct the, uh, the lower orders later. And so how you do that is you go to the manager function here and you untick the constraints here in the refraction tab. And then you're telling the laser only correct the irregular astigmatism. Don't worry about the cylinder and the sphere. We can deal with that later. We then go to the pyramid and we maximize, sorry, minimize the depth of ablation there too. That saves them more tissue. So we're only concentrating on the really dominant aberrations here, that's coma and spherical aberration. And then we are ready to do our ablation. It always looks the same in keratoconus like this. And again, the key point to emphasize is by using the manager function, on ticking the constraints, we're in the, we're in the top end of the tolerance factor in Thomas's scheme there. We're telling the laser, we don't mind about the refraction outcome. We do care about how much the patient can see in spectacles. And you get a pattern like this, it's nice to compare it with the higher order aberrations, and then you're ready to go. 
And these are the results we've shown very consistent. We get flattening over the, the apex of the, of the keratoconus and we get steepening over the top of the cornea here and we're centralizing the, the, um, centralizing the corneal vertex there, getting a much more natural pattern. These are four consecutive treatments from our series of 50 selected at random. And here's the paper and you can screenshot that if you want to follow that up. So sorry to race through that. As I say, you can go back to that if you want to, but I don't want to overset my time too much. I'll leave plenty of time for your questions and the discussion we're going to have with Sam and everybody else. Now, there is one other thing I wanted to share with you, and um, I'm going to try and do that very briefly in the discussion. I won't show you the video because it's really self-evident. So if we can come back to the discussion, I'll talk as we're doing that. And that's to say we had a very interesting complication post-COVID uh, at Moorfields. We brought in when we restarted uh, our program of putting our patients into masks to do their treatments. And um, we were going along very happily with that. But I encountered a very unusual complication the other day in which we had the intralase glass fogging up during treatment because of exhaled vapor escaping from an anxious patient during the treatment. And although that's, we did quite a few treatments before we encountered that, really, if you think it through, in terms of your experience as a surgeon, the way some surgeons quite often tape the top of their mask to help them see under the microscope, it's really something we should have been doing. And so if you're not already, already using occlusive uh, taping above, on top of the mask when you're treating patients since you've restarted post-COVID, I'd really encourage you to do this so you avoid any problems with fogging um, of the glass during your femtosecond ablation and indeed any... Uh, any attenuation of the excima laser beam during your excima laser treatment. So you may well already have incorporated that into your post-COVID treatment protocols, but if you haven't, I'd strongly recommend doing it. Just something I'd like to share with you there for a simple and avoidable problem. So with, uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Sam as the moderator. Sam, are you there? Yes, uh, yes I am. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. This was also an excellent discussion uh, into the into the insights of the clinical use of one workflow, which was to to a large extent similar to to what Thomas was presenting, with some differences, but also you continuously emphasize the need for for having a, a method behind, for having a systematic uh, behind, for having a protocol, as, as as you mentioned. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start the discussion, giving you both the opportunity to to place a question for for the other, uh, if you have one. So you are the you are the panelist, so to speak. So Thomas, do you have any question for 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 Bruce? Yeah, Bruce, I found your presentation excellent. It was uh, bringing the clinical aspects, which was missing in my presentation, and I like your your style and. Um, I will go on your homepage, not your homepage, on your YouTube channel and check out for your beautiful videos. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have to do this more regular. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, I should say the production quality is not quite the production quality. You have a twin, but I'm doing my best. I think hopefully there's some useful messages. And I think particularly um, it's uh, one of the things that uh, that is very helpful, I think, uh, for the users is just to walk through the steps in programming with their laptop, maybe showing them YouTube while they're working on programming a case themselves, just to look through that. And I'm, I'm hoping that there's some things there that will give them confidence to, to do a really important thing. I think that, uh, as I David emphasized this too, and I think that getting used to doing custom treatments as part of your uh, routine workflow is has some real advantages, you know, and uh, my, my worry is that the results from aberration free treatment are so good uh, that people are in the comfort zone with them, really. And, uh, and you know, it's all about the last 0.1% here. And, uh, and I think, my, as I say, my reasons for encouraging your users to explore the Paramis platform are two things, really. One is to um, give them confidence to branch out into doing the therapeutic treatments and get familiar with, the, with it. And uh, the second thing is, as I say, I think that uh, 
that it does have advantages for measurement precision and also for protection from human error. I think these two things are important. Yeah, uh, indeed, I have a question about your uh, presentation. Did I got it well that you always are using the offset with zero, zero, so that you don't enter the offset? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd be interested in Sam's uh, opinion of it because uh, it's, uh, it's even you know, the great thing about working with you guys is that uh, is that we're we're able to find out when we're getting things wrong, and so so I I have always done that from the very beginning with wavefront treatment. I was previously um, with uh, the Visix platform, which is as you know made it a big thing. It was wavefront guided treatment, and the dogma there was center over the people uh, because you're acquiring the wavefront over the people. My understanding, Sam, is that it actually doesn't matter whether you do or don't set that box to zero. Is that right or wrong? Uh, uh, the Germans, they have a very nice expression for, for this, so uh, it is right and wrong uh, uh, at, the, at the same time. But uh, So let me explain this very briefly, since uh, I shall not take the podium from you. Uh, so uh, if you go therapeutic, uh, and you really do not care much about the refraction that is left behind, and you go to the minimize functions. Simply, if you use the offset or not the offset, the minimize function will find a different solution that considering the offset and not considering the offset, the numbers will be, will be different, the ablation will be similar because the numbers are expressed for a different uh, reference uh, position. Uh, for that reason, if you go therapeutic, uh, it doesn't matter whether you use it or you do not use it, simply the numbers, the system uh, displays will be different, but the solution will be similar in general. Now, so to the most... The same ablation, is that right, Sam? Similar. It cannot be identical, but similar. Or very similar. Or put it in other words, if we would use the Zernike orders to the infinity, then they would be identical. Since we truncate the expansion in a given order, eighth order, tenth order, then they will be very similar, but not identical. Uh, but uh, the most classical case is when you when you consider refraction. It's not always that you have a therapeutic, when you consider refraction. Uh, in, in this case, the closer you trust the refraction of the barometer, as you do, the, the more normal becomes that the offset is set to zero because the barometer refraction classically defined uh, is reported for the pupil center. So you are trusting that, that refraction expressed for the pupil center. It doesn't make sense that you apply now this refraction in another reference position. But the more they deviate from the manifest refraction, and the more you tweak your refraction from the wavefront refraction to the manifest refraction, by whichever reasons, it's not your case, but, but maybe the case from some others uh, in the audience, the more you go to the manifest refraction, then the more you shall consider that the manifest refraction is likely not to the pupil center, but elsewhere. And this elsewhere is shown in the literature to be closer to the corneal vertex and to the pupil center. Does it make right. sense? I think I've got it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Thanks. I think that um, I'm going to go away, Sam, after this, and put a cold towel over my head and think for five minutes and see if I get there. And if I don't, <laughs> I'm come, going to come back to you. Okay. So, but um, so I, I'm, we're talking about the last point one percent, then, really, here, aren't we? But uh, the the one thing I would say is that um, personally, I do trust the abrometric refraction. And although I work with uh, optometrists that I've worked with for many years, and I think they are, you know, very high caliber, and uh, that's important in refractive surgery. Really, what I'm asking them to do is uh, is to check the sphere uh, when we have the. We always start our, our patient flow with the aberrometry, and so they come to the optometrist with those numbers. And uh, what I'm really asking the optometrist to do more than anything. Uh, because I really trust the cylinder and the um, well, the cylinder in, in, in particular, in terms of the refraction from the auto refraction. I'm really asking them to refine the sphere because the weak point for all aberrometers, uh, and 
Um, I think this does include Paramis, although it's not bad at all in terms of uh, uh, proximity to the manifest refraction, is that some patients will accommodate during the scan. And one thing that manifest refraction is very good on is control over accommodation. So I think that really for the, uh, if um, the users in the audience on any laser platform are asking how you integrate wavefront treatments, it's really in that way. We're not uh, doing the manifest refraction first and using that as our, our I'm putting inverted commas around this uh, as our gold standard. Actually, the gold standard for me is the aberometric refraction with the proviso that you need the optometrist to check that the accommodation is not a big feature. And uh, so that's that's the key thing there. Okay, okay. I think it's a good time to move to the questions by the audience. I have a few questions uh, through both the talks that we can go through, but let's go to the to the audience. So one question, and it is addressed to Bruce, but uh, I would put it open to you both, uh, is whether you always use the 50 or the fixed or the pre-default epithelial thickness from the device, or whether you customize based on, for instance, OCT measurements. Yeah, so that's that's um, a, a really very good question indeed. And the answer is we customize, uh, not routinely. Uh, I should say that in routine myopic uh, trans PRK, for example, uh, but certainly in any cases that have had uh, that are abnormal or cases that have that the best example would be let's say a previous uh, high myopic ablation and you're coming back to say a retreat uh, after a trans PRK and uh, then it's very good to do se segmental tomography and to look at the epithelial thickness and adjust for that because it's going to tend to be thicker uh, over the center and the converse for a previous hyperopic treatment. So in retreatments, I think it's really important. Um, it's less important in routine, routine treatment. So, Personally, I don't customize for uh, routine primary treatment, but for everything else, yes. And uh, customize only the central one. The central epithelium. That that's right. And I um, I famous. This is an example of where I famously uh, got, got got it wrong when I got very excited and saw that you could adjust the uh, the diameter of epithelial treatment in treatments. Uh, we wanted to expand the optical zone in some of our combined cross-linking and uh, therapeutic treatments, the ectasias, because we want a large zone for the epithelial removal. And uh, I had to understand later that that was just a modulation of the peripheral epithelial thickness yeah, yeah, yeah. Measure yeah. on the adjustment there. So, but yeah, I think that um, so more and more of us are having access to instruments like the MS-39, also from the same manufacturer as the Paramis, which is really excellent for epithelial thickness, but there are other ways of measuring it. And if you have that, I think you know, the classic example would be trans-PRK retreatment. It's really helpful to have that measurement. Yeah. We do it in a very similar fashion in our application department. Once you have the information from the epithelial map, which comes more and more, this information becomes more popular as the device becomes more popular, we use the central value to enter the center value in the software and let the software then calculate what is in the periphery. Even if we have good measurements from the epithelial thickness in the periphery, um, we still would have the situation that we have it superior, inferior, and all these four quadrants. Yeah. And to average it and to calculate it by ourselves is something which might be interesting, but we are missing the experience, what is really the best way to do it. So to being on the safe side, especially for us, we do the same what you was mentioning. We populate the central value and let the software calculate the periphery. Not saying that this is a non plus ultra, but this is a way which generally works quite well. Yeah. And it would be interesting to, to have some studies now, some publications or some some more information how it really would be if we consider all these other values. That would be interesting. Excellent. Uh, there is another question from the audience that uh, is recurrent in, in my experience. Uh, I would address this to Bruce first. Uh, when you do ocular wave from the scans 
or when you compare your ocular wavefront scans with your with your topography map, usually the coverage is larger with the with the topography. Uh, actually, you put in your slides that uh, you require 5.5 millimeters for the scan to be valid for guiding the uh, the ablation. So, how often does it happen that the scans are not large enough? And what do you do when this happens? So when the scans are not large enough and we would be um, compromising our optical zone by doing, let's say we've got a, uh, we want a 6.5 millimeter um, optical zone if we in routine myopic uh, LASIK and we get a five millimeter acquisition on the, or a four and a half millimeter acquisition on the aberrometer, we would be doing an aberration free treatment. So that's in our little uh, decision tree that we've got. I mean, that's one of the steps, really. We're looking for a 5.5 millimeter scan. We get, uh, I should say, in terms of, to give you a feel for it, uh, we treat 85% of our routine myopic treatments, ocular wavefront now. So it's about 15% of patients, typically the older patients have a smaller pupil and uh, in whom we're, we're not getting um, a large enough pupil to avoid compromising the optical zone. So most of the younger patients with a mesopic acquisition do indeed have a large enough mesopic pupil, particularly the keratoconus case, the ectasias for the customized treatments, we very seldom have a pupil that's too small. But, um, but yeah, if we don't have that, then if we're, we do want to do a customized treatment, then you're looking at a corneal wavefront treatment is, is the next best thing. In routine treatments, it's straight to aberration free if we don't have a 5.5 millimeter acquisition. Hmm. As the software allows 20% to extrapolate, to expand the zone, it would give you for the 5.5, 6.6 6 millimeter as a maximum optical zone, plus the transition zone, yeah. which is, I think, in a lot of cases, fine for your treatment. The, the, the default for aberration free, which we are, we've all been working with is 6.5, right? 6.3, 6.5. Yeah. yeah, that's the default. Yeah. So, I mean, if you don't want to compromise on that, you, uh, with the system set up as it is, you need a 5.5 millimeter scan. Mm. So, some other platforms uh, allow you to expand from, uh, extrapolate from a small acquisition diameter. Sam, did you want to comment on why it is that we're not allowed to go any smaller than 5.5? Uh, you can go with more than 5.5, but as you mentioned, uh, then you will be limiting the optical zone. Uh, we do not want to risk extrapolating because as as it is in the world, you are just guessing what is out there. You may yes. have a, a more educated guess or a less educated guess, but you are yeah. simply guessing what is out uh, uh, there. Uh, the alternative would be to chunk the, the ablation to whatever it is measured and and extend it with only a spheric treatment. So a combination of a, of a ocular wavefront chunk and uh, abrasion-free periphery. But yeah. this leads to a very sudden jump in the, so just, in the correction. So I'm just gonna play the devil's advocate here and just give you a couple of clinical um, situations we run into quite often. That, that let's say we can't get a five millimeter acquisition diameter on either the wavefront or the topographer. And uh, at the moment on the topographer, we have to type in manually the K values if we can't get a, um, a five millimeter area. But really, what is the worst thing that can happen if you were to expand from, say, a four millimeter acquisition in the routine? If the patient has a smaller pupil, surely they only need a small optical zone. Uh, I mean, if really the patient has a small pupil, then the 20% extra optical zone shall be fine. The worst that may happen is that you have a four millimeter scan, no matter what the pupil is, and that you really want to expand to say six, which means 50% more, or 6.5, which means 70% uh, uh, more. And, and then uh, you are so much guessing that you need so much tissue or that you are so much off from what the reality is that the result is worse than having done nothing. So this is the worst case uh, scenario. How likely it, it is, is another story. There are a number of, of references in the literature, some of them by some of my former professors, 
uh, that they have, uh, say, low risk educated guests. Uh, but it's always a, a, a balance. And we decided that we, we put a bit more pressure on you to get good scans. We facilitate extending something, but not unlimited extending, because we, we feel that some people otherwise would take any scan, no matter four, four, five, or five, and try to expand to the 7.5 optical zone as they wish. So we try okay. to find the balance between your efforts and our efforts. So I'm, I'm going to try and persuade you at some point to reconsider and maybe go up from four millimeters in some circles. I, I appreciate everything you said, but it's, uh, it's sometimes useful to be able to use uh, yeah. custom modality of a smaller zone. I can, I can talk to you off the record about, about something at this, at this regard, but let's move to the, to the, to the next uh, question here, because now the, the chat is, is being active. Uh, so there was Maybe a then. question you talk uh, about uh, therapeutic treatment and then there was a question in those cases how important is the trans prk haze whether you have any pearls to prevent it or even if you actually uh, consider this in the in the in the planning that haze may occur and through that refraction shift may occur well <laughs> The, the answer is mitomycin C, of course, the, uh, but um, do we get haze in some cases with, despite using mitomycin C? The answer is yes, uh, and particularly the post-keratoplasty cases. And so it's, it's uh, a factor, but um, we're often, um, it's generally a factor in patients who are already in quite a lot of trouble. And it's very unusual to make somebody worse with a therapeutic trans-PRK if you're using mitomycin C. So I accept that haze can occur and there are the most, uh, the best strategy for avoiding it is to A, use mitomycin C and B, pre-treat the ocular surface. I think this is very important to make sure that the eye is not, uh, is, is in the, the ocular surface is in the best condition. Uh, there's no inflammation at the time of treatment. I'll give you a particular example here that's common. That's in therapeutic treatments for keratoconus, say a trans-PRK cross-linking case, many keratoconus patients also are rubbing their eyes for a reason. They have uh, atopic problems and um, allergic conjunctivitis. And if you can work on the ocular surface first, that really helps you. So I think a combination of optimizing the ocular surface, controlling inflammation, and mitomycin C are, are the best ways of dealing with AIDS. What do you think about uh, chill PSS or something cool to cool down the eye a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there, there are many uh, minor um, variations that, that are advocated, and I don't have a strong sense of how important they are. This, but I would put chill BSS in the bracket of does no harm, probably does some good. There's at least some intuitive and laboratory evidence that does some good. And after all, every time I see my poor football team play, uh, they, <laughs> they have players sitting on the bench after the first 20 minutes with an ice pack on their knee and say they must be doing that for a reason. I think mm -hmm. that it, uh, you know, it's, it's helpful. And, um, you know, the other thing that's really helpful in terms of reducing haze, I think it's just anything you can do to accelerate epithelial healing. And I think that trans-PRK is an advance there because it speeds epithelial healing. And so, you know, this again switches off the uh, the uh, cytokine drive to haze, so that helps. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so there is also a question of you are doing femtolasic with ocular waveform for routing cases, and then there is the question of whether the wow effects or the excellent superb results also extend to the high astigmatism cases. Can you comment yeah. on that? Well, I, if I, Thomas, shall I go on this as well? The, uh, I mean, I think certainly the the strong area for uh, for the paramus in our evaluation so far has been astigmatism. Uh, we looked at um, whether or not we needed to do a nomogram adjustment for astigmatism, and the answer is it was no. And uh, so, um, you know, the experience so far has been extremely positive with astigmatism, and uh, yeah, definitely a wow well factor. Thomas? Mm. 
I don't know really. Yeah. Because the, 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 the device, if I'm not mistaken, and now I'm, I'm talking out of the tip of my head, but I think it can measure up to 15 diopter of astigmatism, definitely way beyond what you can treat uh, uh, with, the, with the system. But it is difficult to find evidence when you go for five, six, seven diopter of astigmatism, whether there is good correspondence between manifest and, and the barometric, and, or whether this barometric plug into the laser does the same good job as for the minus two, minus three uh, seals. Yeah. yeah, and, and furthermore, yeah. for the high astigmatism, we, re we recommend large optical zone. We recommend typically seven millimeter or, or more for the high astigmatism. So that might be sometimes really challenging for the ocular wavefront. Well, yeah, but it, it, um, it, you know, so far as I say, the, re the results are good. But, but I think, Thomas, it's a really important point. The optical zone is important. You don't want to compromise on that uh, in treating astigmatism. But Sam, if you're talking about sort of 15 diopters, you're in the stage one of my one, two, three approach, really. You need to do a definitely, a, definitely. A stigmatic keratotomy to calm that down first, you know, and uh, you know, you need to be within the zone. So I believe it's six diopters that uh, is the top end for the um, for the Amaris. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So the, in the yeah. yeah, I mean a clinical scenario that uh, that I've encountered recently is high hyperopic astigmatism in patients who are um, re re developing um, developing cataracts, and uh, it's quite nice to do a, um, a what you might call a bioptics treatment or a planned sequential treatment in these patients, and calm the astigmatism down first before doing the cataract surgery. And we've had some nice results in some, you know, sort of five, six diopter cases recently uh, in that group. This brings exactly to the next question by the audience. Uh, and it is, what is your experience with ocular wavefront in hyperopia? Yeah. So before I go on, I should say I've mis misspoken there in terms of, of you wouldn't do an ocular wavefront treatment of a patient with a cataract, by the way. That was doing an asymptomatic treatment of a patient with a cataract. So, but if you go back after the lens is implanted, you can certainly do a wavefront guided treatment, providing you're using a monofocal lens. So I'm, I'm so glad I had the opportunity to say those two particular things to emphasize the important point that was right at the beginning of Thomas's decision tree is that if the lens is abnormal, don't operate in the cornea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, Sorry, your experience, yeah. not, 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 not in the cataract uh, approaching uh, patients, but uh, for routine cases, what is your experience in hyperopia? Routine hyperopia, yeah, no, we don't use wavefront treatments for routine hyperopia. The reason being that, uh, that they're uh, almost universally an older age group. And so I don't really do uh, laser correction for hyperopia in, in young patients. If we get the occasional young patient who's way out there and we'll put an ICL in, but generally speaking, it's people who are in you know, the sort of presbyopic age group. And the classical hyperopic treatment, um, if we're doing LASIK on them, which works great, by the way, there's far too much lens exchange going on for me and the kind of people in my kind of age group and younger. Um, and that's, um, you know, then we would do an aberration free treatment. Uh, I can't really see a lot of point in doing wavefront guided treatments in people who are, you know, getting, get, my kind of age really it's really more for the for the uh, sub 50 bracket we do do them but uh but you know the default for hyperopia is certainly aberration free i haven't explored the wavefront treatments for hyperopia thomas i think it was it was in your slides i think but the, the question came anyway uh, what is the position of the company with respect to applying pharmacological pupil dilation for making the wavefront scans. Yeah, we, we always give the clear comment that we do not recommend to use uh, pharmaceutical drops to dilate the pupil. Yeah. So um, that's uh, quite clear. Even if the pupil is too small and even if you dim the room, it might not work enough. So then what was Bruce was mentioning also, that's what we say, then maybe switch to aberration free 
or switch to aberration free and proceed with a corneal wave front end maybe yeah, afterwards or, or simultaneously. But from our side application, we recommend always not to use uh, any medication to dilate the pupil prior to make this measurement. Yeah. Bruce? Well, I'd agree with that because it affects the pupil centroid and, and that could affect your ablation and, uh, and it affects your accommodation function as well. And so all these things uh, are, you know, I think that something we learned in the trip with, with customized LASIK, wavefront guided LASIK, through the, right at the beginning of the thing, uh, we were encouraged to dilate the pupil, but that has been abandoned uh, some time ago for the reasons that, that Thomas mentioned. Very yeah, minor points on hyperopic treatments with the, is, I don't use wavefront guidance in routine hyperopic treatments, but we've certainly had some nice results in the therapeutic, like a post-RK case, for example, we've had several of those, they work great. So there's no reason not to use uh, wavefront guided treatments in hyperopia, but, uh, but for me, I'm not using them routinely in, in, hyper, in, in, um, in normalized with hyperopia. Furthermore, we have the pupil centroid shift, which if you would dilate it artificially, then the laser might try to get the same large pupil as well, but it's not getting it and then running in the borders. So it will not work. And you mentioned already, Bruce, that then you may be misaligned or not optimal uh, aligned with the centers for the ablation. So this is, of course, another reason for that. Yeah. Uh, Bruce, you, you mentioned in your slides, and this was uh, this was very properly, uh, that the repeatability of the wavefront refraction is at least twice as good as uh, the repeatability of the manifest uh, refraction. I agree in general lines with this, but what about the accuracy? So how close were both together? Yeah, so this is the difference between pre precision and accuracy. In other words, you've got to have both. It's got to be a measurement that is repeatable and uh, it's got to be close to the true value. But what is the true value? And uh, that's that's the thing that's, um, you know, the, the open question. And uh, so the problem with manifest refraction, as I say, is it's great for accommodation, but it's less good for astigmatism. And, uh, Accuracy there. So I think that that to cut to the the really important message for um, for users really is that my strong view is that use the abrometric refraction for everything except ask your optometrist to refine the sphere, and uh, then you will get good results consistently. Okay, but anyway, do we have a uh, not to put you under pressure, but do you have a ballpark number? Uh, I mean. How close was the stigmatism compared to what the refraction, or they do not, they do not care at all about the stigmatism in the manifest refraction. This is point one, and okay. the second one, when they tweak the sphere for accommodation, how close or how far they need to go from the barometric measure refraction? Okay. So now, now I understand the question. Okay, so there 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 are two patient groups to consider. There are the normalized, the routine treatments, and the, the, yeah. there are the therapeutic treatments. Okay. So I'll take the normalized first. We're, we're looking for a scan sequence within half a diopter of the uh, of each other, the scans. Uh, so they're repeatable scans and within half a diopter of the manifest spherical equivalent. And if it's not within half a diopter, we go back and check the uh, manifest refraction and do a forced choice where we put up the wavefront refraction mm -hmm. and we put up the manifest refraction. And then we take a view on which one to go with. And if there are big changes, you look at cycloplegic refraction to check, particularly in the cases of astigmatism, uh, those kind of cases where you can get a bit of uh, accommodation. So then that's the normalized. So looking for free scans within half a diopter, and also the scan you're choosing should be within half a diopter of the manifest refraction, ideally. Although I, I should be honest with you and say, I stray outside that regularly with the checks that I just mentioned. The other group of patients is different. That's the therapeutic cases. Now here, your, and this is a really important point, your manifest refraction is not just inaccurate, it's super inaccurate. You're not getting good corrected acuities uh, with this thing. And if you, for example, the best example would be keratin conus. Uh, if um, people who are tuning in just look at their keratin conus refractions and, and you can send somebody back 
uh, for a second go at a refraction on the same day with keratoconus, and you have two completely different results. It's, it's highly variable. So the more irregular the cornea is, the less useful manifest refraction data actually is. And the more, so I think the, the key point to emphasize for the therapeutic cases is the thing you need is consistency in your, in your three scans. Or, and so if you've got a good scan sequence and your scans are agreeing with each other, even if they're not agreeing with the manifest refraction, I think that the, uh, the best place to base your treatment is in the scans. So I mean, Thomas, um, you might like to comment on the tolerance function and the, um, the decision-making in relation to that, because one thing I didn't fully understand, and uh, it may be just me, was the calculation of the vectorial mean. Are you there taking uh, a mean that takes into account manifest refraction astigmatism as well, or is it the mean of the measured uh, with your different device? Yeah, it takes into account uh, five different um, uh, refractions. So first of all, the manifest refraction, including sphere, cylinder, and axis. Then the aberrometer refraction at four millimeter, uh, also sphere, cylinder, and, act, and axis. And if the, in case this is not available there, if you don't have an aberrometer, then you can use an outer refractometer. Then the second was, or the third was the K readings. So the uh, K readings only provide the astigmatism, including the axis. And then we have the wavefront measurement, either corneal or ocular, depending on the decision tree. And you take, you grab the corneal wavefront astigmatism at four millimeter and six millimeter, including the axis. And then out of these five refractive values, the software or you calculate the vectorial mean. And then you can sometimes get, uh, as seen in my example, lower values in sphere and slightly different uh, other values in uh, astigmatism. Typically, they are close by, but not identical. Yeah. And so, again, for understanding, once you've done the calculation on the cylinder, you're then adjusting the sphere to be close to the manifest refraction spherical equivalent. Is that what I'm seeing there? Yeah. Did I, did I say that in the right way? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I didn't got it well, yeah, Sam? Yeah, no, no, more... no, no, right. So okay. the proposition is yeah. that, that we take the average spherical equivalent of the subjective and the objective refraction. And this mm -hmm. spherical equivalent is kept constant. Now we play around with the ceiling in a vectorial way. And then we calculate back the sphere that will lead to that spherical equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's again, it's again a, a demonstration of an, of an educated guess. We take all sources of astigmatism that may play a role for this particular case, subjective, objective, corneal toricity, and also the wave from astigmatism for small and large diameter of the type of treatment you are considering. And with these five values, we make an educated guess or where the astigmatism may most likely be. Right, got it. So the, the um, as I say, the the word of caution that uh, that I would share there is that I think it's it's important to understand that the limitations of manifest refraction, and uh, particularly in the irregular corneas. So, but you have only me, one. You have only me, one manifest refraction and four objective ones. Yeah, sure. No, that, I, I've got that, and 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 I, I understand that absolutely. But if you have a I think look at your scan sequence. If you have a good scan sequence, then you can be quite confident. If you have a bad scan sequence, you should be considering another approach. And that was the thinking with the hierarchy there in terms of going to a, say a, a PTK if you are really not getting good scan information in the therapeutic treatment. Yeah. At this, well, at this regard, oh, sorry, Thomas, go ahead. I just want to add that the result and the quality of the result Starts with the measurement, yeah. And if the measurement is poor or weak and showing some some problematics, then it is as a consequence going through all the calculations till the end, till the profile is applied. Yeah. So the really good base and this, it's a risk which is added by any corneal or ocular wavefront. It's a risk which you do not have an aberration free. That's why we typically recommend if you don't have higher order aberrations, which are indicated as red or, or maybe a few yellows. If you don't have that, if they are all green, 
and if you don't have a visual acuity less than 2020, and if there are no symptoms from the patient, no complaints, why we vote for aberration free? Because otherwise, if you would not have this risk of a good measurement, you can easily, you could go for customized treatment for everyone. Yeah, but then you have the risk of the good measurement. That's, that's where you need to apply the filters. And if you don't get a good scan sequence and you need your criteria for that, then I absolutely agree with you. Aberration free treatment is the safest approach. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at, the, at this regard of astigmatism, and I think this is a very important uh, point, a uh, question or comment uh, came in uh, also from a Peramis user uh, saying that uh, in his experience, at least for mixed astigmatism, unlike for myopic astigmatism, the wave from diffraction may overestimate the, uh, that astigmatism that is tolerated by the patient, at least for mixed astigmatism. So it's not blindly trusting what the wavefront refractor is giving, uh, but if the patient cannot tolerate this, what would be your take on that? Well, I think that there's um, some, there's been some nice work published on astigmatism. I'm not sure if Paramus results have been published yet, uh, but I mean, we, we, experience we've had has been good. I think what I can be really clear on is that in normal eyes, the correction of astigmatism is, is really, I think it does add a le level of precision. Um, mixed astigmatism, we just, you know, we have a relatively small number of cases. It's, it's hard to give you a clear conclusion to that, but, but the, the, my gut feeling on the cases we've treated so far, I mean, I might treat, um, five or 10 maximum mixed astigmatism cases a year. So they're really not a large number in my practice. And so, but I mean, they look good. So, you know, so far so good, but I haven't really got enough data to come with any authority on that. And so um, if there are Paramus users out there who have got that data, it would be just great if you would share it and, uh, and put it into publication. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um... So there is another excellent question getting in also on on regard of refraction. It seems it's really a hot topic. So thank you very much both for for getting through through this. And it is Bruce, you mentioned for some fifteen percent of your cases, you cannot apply ocular wavefront, likely because the scan is not wide enough. And then I never thought this, but this is a very good question for those ones. Which refraction are you typing? The wavefront refraction, or now you forget what you have said about, and you enter the manifest refraction. Yeah, well, actually, it's a really good question. The uh, so we're doing an aberration-free treatment now, but um, so what the optometrist has got, even if we can't use it for the treatment, is a very good auto refraction. So at minimum, uh, the Paramus is a great auto refractor, and uh, so they're using that information in their it feeds through into the manifest refraction but it's those numbers that I get back from the optometrist that we're typing in to the aberration free screen in the usual way. Okay, excellent, excellent. Thank you, this, this was important, I think. How about uh, the vectorial mean? Would it be an alternative in that situation? The vectorial mean of the five reflective values? Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just to play another idea in the game. I, I'll, I'll have to, again, that's that's one for me to go into a quiet corner and think about for a while, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Thomas, I know, I know that I'm the moderator, but you are also at least, at least the co-organizer. We are now 15 minutes uh, beyond schedule time. Uh, what do you think? I have uh, two or three questions more. Shall we let it here? I think we add these two or three questions as long as people attend, we can go ahead for this and then we stop after these two or three questions, not to bother Bruce too much yeah. for this evening. Uh, look, okay. I, I, I'm happy to stay here until they call the police. You know, it's... <laughs> so, uh, uh, now again for, for, for you both, maybe again Bruce first, but also Thomas, please comment uh, about this. Uh, you mentioned, Bruce, in your talk, that you use ocular wavefront uh, among others because considers the 
the effects of the posterior cornea on the aberrations. Uh, this is true, uh, but you do not know what else is also included in the ocular waveform. So, and now we have tomographers like the MS39 that can offer a pretty decent and pretty detailed anterior and posterior surface. So you can have corneal waveform of the anterior or corneal waveform of the total cornea. This would be only anterior and posterior and exclude other sources of potential aberrations. Would you then go to total corneal waveform or you still think the ocular waveform is the way to go because of these other unknowns? So if you have a perfect total corneal wavefront measurement, you, you won basically because you're operating on the cornea and provided that the lens doesn't have um, you know, a problem with, for example, astigmatism, then treating um, on the cornea makes absolute sense. At the moment, where we are, we are not quite there yet with the with total corneal power. And as things stand, topography guided treatments are based on the surface. I think in the ectasias, you're missing an important component there. And uh, that's demonstrated through treatment depths if you do the planning. And also in, uh, in normal corneas, the, if you look at the work of Doug Coach, anyone who's uh, into toric lens calculation will be aware of the effect of posterior corneal astigmatism. And uh, it's a significant factor. So it'd be absolutely great if we can move to a stage where we've got uh, total corneal power. And then I would be much more in David's camp and say, look, let's do it all. We're doing a corneal treatment. Let's work with corneal inflammation. Inflammation. So Thomas, now is the ball on your field. I have the same opinion he is sharing. Yeah, once we would have the endothelial side and the back side of the cornea as an inflammation with a kind of Scheinflug or OCT. And having this involved in our ablation pattern, that would be a great thing. And uh, yeah, but currently we we either topographically only measure the top of the surface, yeah, or ocular wavefront, uh, the total aberrations of the eye, including the back side of the cornea, the posterior side. So um, I think in that situation, both has its good values, and uh, um, yeah, that's the situation. Okay. Um, Sam, just the, just yeah. the emphasis, Sam, I think it's very important that uh, to always remember, you know, never operate on an abnormal lens uh, with, with ocular wavefront, never um, use it with a multifocal lens either. And so I think that uh, those, those are, the second message may have some, uh, some modulators, but basically as a rule of thumb, just uh, keep that in mind. I think it's very important to uh, keep those limitations there. Yeah, once we had a, a situation and uh, uh, had been confronted where the patient uh, had um, um, severe higher order aberrations with an ocular measurement device. Uh, it was not the pyramid, it was uh, earlier with a different device. And um, the question was, do we shall or shall we do this correction with the ocular wavefront or not? But finally, it was obvious that the visual acuity was. Uh, was 2020, yeah. So obviously there was a compensation for this effect. And uh, this is something you have to consider. And that's why we always say, you have to consider the aberrations in both devices, ideally. You have to consider the, uh, um, the visual acuity and the complaints from the patients. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the major three points which we always refer to. I think the last the last point is very important, Thomas. That's what the patient actually feels about their vision, because you can be six six and miserable. You know, we all have had experience of patients in that category, and so you know, if if the a higher orders are telling you there's a problem, uh, then you need to look at it, even if the vision is twenty twenty. Yeah. And the last question I got uh, is you mentioned in your your scheme, Bruce that if you have good waveform scans, you aim for ocular waveform. If not, you fall back to, uh, to topo-guided corneal waveform. If they are not good scans, you go to, to trans-PTK for therapeutic applications. Yes. Uh, uh, 
what do you mean but not by not good uh, topo scans not repeat not repeatable too small what what do you mean by that and with with current technologies does this at all happen that you do not get good scans from the topography yeah so in in irregular corneas we 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 do sometimes the problem that we have in some patients is uh, just the anatomy, uh, the, the shadows from the brow, the nose, and uh, maybe they can't get their eyelids wide enough open. And uh, again, we're limited by the export function. We're asked for a five millimeter acquisition zone, and we can't always achieve that. So th those are the kind of limitations. There are some tricks. Um, you can uh, try scanning again with after applying artificial tears, if uh, that's sometimes helpful. And uh, but. You know, yes, we do have cases in whom we can't get either a good wavefront scan sequence or a good topography scan sequence. But then that's really a clue that we're trying to do perhaps too much with a customized treatment and that uh, we're really in step one of the of the one, two, three scheme for regular astigmatism there rather than step two. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have covered most of the questions from the audience and also from my notes uh, i thank you both very much for your excellent contributions uh, i think that also the audience have participated and could take a lot with them for their next experiences uh, it's yet to be seen how many of them would embrace wavefront guided how many of them would move to corner wavefront or how many of them would stay to average on free because it is so easy and uh, and rather uh, good. Uh, Thomas, any closing notes? Yeah, I just want to point out that this workflow I introduced was uh, generated by my colleagues and uh, Samuel also has been involved. So it was a, a progressing work over the time, over the years, and it's not certainly not reached the end. It will further improve, and our last improvement was uh, to check out from the central thickness. To the peripheral and see if uh, this fluctuation how they should uh, be considered so i'm sure it will further be modified in the future we did not reach the end of the of the goal but uh, that i want to express to each of every one of you yeah and thank you bruce for your uh for your help for these presentations for this uh, wonderful discussion here thank you and for this moderation it's a real pleasure i just want to finish by Thanking all of the uh, all the attendees who uh, I hope are as enthusiastic as I am to work with you guys at Twind in in really pushing the boundaries and helping our patients more. I think it's the programming flexibility you brought to us is is unique and it's fantastic. And uh, I, I'm really excited about uh, about what's coming in the next ten years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. We we keep on track. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all, listeners and colleagues. Thank you. Bye-bye.